We'll be reading the verses 14 through 16, as that, that will be the text of the message. Let's pay careful attention as we read the Word of God. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, asking, requesting, Lord, that you may do a work among us. May your presence be made known among us as your holy word is read, as it is expounded. I pray, Lord, that it may come across to the hearts and minds clearly. It come, may it come out of my mouth clearly that it may be understood and applied. And Lord, ultimately, that your holy name be exalted. Lord, we recognize that we are the only gospel that some people will ever hear in our lives. I pray, Lord, that that may be the case in the people in this church. I pray that the world may see them and hear them, recognize that they are of you, that they possess God in their hearts. And may they be irresistible to the consciences of those around them, and that they may, that they may be drawn to Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Now we, as we mentioned, I believe last week, we finished the main body of the book of Romans. And now we enter into the conclusion of the book. And this conclusion is rather lengthy. It goes from the middle of chapter 15, where we have now begun in verse 14 to the end of the book and various things are are covered Uh, Paul encourages the church in the faith explains his purpose warns them of danger and uh, fills them in on his future plans and some of them are rather personal plans what his plans will be for the future he has then as we get to chapter 16 uh, the uh, personal greetings to several within the church Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary, compares the finishing of this book to the coming at end of something nice that you look forward to, such as a vacation. You you spend all year long waiting for this particular time that you're going to go someplace and enjoy certain things or be with certain people and get to spend some time uh, perhaps off of work, away from the stress of the world. And then you spend that time and as inevitably it comes to an end. And you have that feeling, huh, all that time I've waited, all that money perhaps that I invested in this, and now it's gone. It's a similar feeling to this, you know, we spent all of this time investing in the book of Romans, and now we're done. You know, and the way that our human nature is, I could probably go right back to the beginning and start all over, because most of us have forgotten most of the things that were said anyway. So we could do this again, but we won't, because there's many other things in the scriptures to look at. And it would be almost like if you could try to compare. Uh, I remember as a boy, I lived right below Chimney Rocks in Hollidaysburg. And in summer times, we would get bored. And so a bunch of us kids would get together. Let's just scale up to Chimney Rocks. Yeah, so we would spend, the, and this is before you could drive up there, you know, and all of that. You had to, we scaled the front of the, of, of the of face, we called the mountain. And get to the top, and we'd sit on the Indian chair, they called it, the rocks there. And, spend, and feel like we really accomplished something. But try to picture that uh, a, a person who has conquered Mount Everest looking at that hill you know, and saying, you know, well, what is that? I, I think when we get to Romans, you get to the Mount Everest. And now where do we go? You know, Jimmy Rocks is nothing compared to Mount Everest. So, well, we finished the Mount Everest of theology and doctrine. So now we, we, we need to move on. But we're not quite finished. We still have the uh, conclusion to cover. Now, there are several things which Paul emphasizes here that we can learn from, and this will be the focus of our next several weeks as we bring the book to a close. And so first of all, let's look at verse 14 of chapter 15. 
I was planning on actually covering a good bit of the chapter, but again, there's just too much here uh, to rush over it. Verse 14, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. What we have here, I believe, are the marks of a good church, the marks of a biblical church. Paul starts out by expressing his confidence in the church at Rome. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren. Notice he addresses them as my brothers. Now this, uh, the words may not be uh, flattering or not meant to be flattering as far as churches go, but the church of Rome was in many ways an example of an ideal church, not a perfect church. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect church. I've heard people say, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. Yeah, but there are no such thing as a perfect church. We do have an ideal church. And Paul addresses them as such. And this is a worthy example of a church that I think that we as Community Bible Church ought to follow in this example. He first of all commends them. We find that the very beginning of the book that he has already done so, verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you, all, for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, obviously we don't mean the entire world, but the whole Roman world, the, the whole world of, that was known to the, the Romans at that time. Uh, there was people sp speaking about this church which was in Rome. Now, the Roman church is believed to have been founded uh, by those coming back from Pentecost. Now, people came from all over to the Feast of Pentecost, and of course you, you read Acts chapter 2, you see what occurred there. Many, many people converted. Many of these people went back to their homes, and Rome being a center of commerce and a great population, these people got together, those who were, were saved in Pentecost, and they founded this church. So Paul was not involved in the founding of the church. We have seen on occasion in Paul's writings to the Romans some admonitions. You know, we saw them... Uh, when it comes to the spiritually mature, to be gentle to the weaker brethren, the, the less mature, uh, not to judge the stronger brethren. Uh, we have uh, how to, uh, ideas on how to exercise your liberty property, uh, pr properly. I'm sorry. Uh, and we have the util utilizing of spiritual gifts and loving without hypocrisy and, and the idea of, of not exercising revenge. on All of these things we have admonitions uh, with to, the, book, to the, the church of Rome, but overall you don't see serious issues in the Roman church. You read the book of Corinthians. You see the book of Corinthians, you have issues there. You have all kinds of issues. And even when you get to the end of the book, actually I think it's, it might be 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the end of, of both of those, those epistles, that Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith. Some of you folks, you better check these things out. Uh, he had people in the church fomenting division there was immorality in the church there were christians in the church taking other christians to court there were abuses at the lord's table all of this was going on but you don't find that within the book of romans a healthy church has great potential for growth and i'm not talking here numeric growth it's nice as we add people to church it's a joyful time to do so but that is not our goal our goal is not to fill the pews. Well, what can I do to fill the pews of this church? That's not my goal, my primary goal. My primary goal is to feed the church the word, to have them grow spiritually. And the church then will grow. Now, we ought to have evangelism, and we do work toward that in having evangelism, outreaches to the community. But our primary focus for us here this morning, Sunday mornings, is for the growth of the church here that you may grow in grace, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A well-ordered church is able to place much emphasis on doctrine and practical application of the Word of God. Now, the Church of Rome was in that position, and because they were in that position, they were able then to understand many of these and Paul was able to teach them some of these very heavy doctrines that perhaps he wasn't able to in some of the other churches. 
he could not have gone into that theological depth that we see in this epistle. I, I believe that to be the case. We get to, to chapter 11, verse 33, when he exclaims, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. Paul exclaims this after he goes through all of, of these teachings, which are very heavy for the, the, the average person to understand. But he's able to do so because the church is on a good foundation. A well-ordered church is fertile ground for spiritual growth, and it's a place where a steady diet of biblical truth and admonition and encouragement are found, and that's where Christians can grow. We find 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. That's why I'm here, folks, to preach the word. I am not, not here to, to try to discern your felt needs. And then try to meet whatever different needs you may have and meet them. No, I'm here to preach the word. Now, in the process of that, your needs will be met through the word of God. But I, I'm not here to, to try to make everybody happy to make the church uh, more in numbers. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince or reprove. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and teaching or doctrine. So with that in mind, first... Let us all strive here at this church, Community Bible Church, to be obedient in fulfilling our spiritual duties as elders, as deacons, and as church members to our Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, if you're looking for a church, make this the priority of your search. Now, some of us, uh, many times we've had folks here that have had to leave for one reason or another. You know, they are moving to be with family, some in another area of the state or, or country, or they have a job opportunity that they, have, that they, 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 they take, decide to take. So with that in mind, you may have to look for a church. If that's the case, this is what you're looking for. You know, you don't want to look for entertainment and things like that, but where am I going to be spiritually fed the word of God? Now Paul's deep teaching would not have been possible when addressing other churches. Churches, can you imagine? This is what happens. And I've said this before, that we see, you turn on the television, and you'll see these huge churches. Now, there are exceptions to this, what I'm going to say. I mean, you go to Grace Community Church with John MacArthur's teaching, that's, this is an exception, so I'm not pointing out all mega churches. But a lot of these churches, where you've got thousands of people, if you put a biblical pastor behind the pulpit and he begins exhorting them and rebuking them and preaching repentance and sin and and. And, all, all, and, and the blood of Christ and all that and, and their needs, you're going to find that church begin to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. And there'll be a little handful of the true sheep of God there. And because the, many of these churches are geared toward entertainment uh, rather than spiritual growth. Now, so then, what was this church like? Paul describes it, verse 14. He says that you also are full of, of goodness. That's an interesting term. We all know that there, are no, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none good uh, in, in that sense. And in the inhumanity, we all have faults, and especially those without Christ are hopeless without, hopelessly evil without Christ. There's no, no hope with, without, them, without, without the Lord Jesus. But he says to these folks, he said, you're full of goodness. Now this goodness here is... Uh, emphasizes the word here emphasizes the kindly side of goodness as in opposition to meanness this is to be intrinsically good by nature now how can a person be that way because we aren't that way by nature by nature we are bad we are mean we are selfish but how can you be intrinsically good by nature that is if your nature has been transformed Galatians chapter 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And one of these fruits is goodness. We're not talking about here just being nice people. But we're having this quality of goodness which comes from the Spirit of God. So he says you are full of this goodness. You are, you are so controlled by the Spirit of God that this is the first quality. that The, the, the Roman, the Roman uh, uh, Christians were. Uh, this is the first quality that Paul emphasizes. In the church. And this should be how the world views us from the outside. A people so consumed with the goodness of God that it flows from them in every 
area of life and circumstance. In other words, we're not hypocrites. You ought to be genuine, sincere, full of genuine goodness. Goodness that comes from God. The world may not agree with our doctrine. And some may label us holy rollers, though I've never seen anybody in this church rolling you know, uh, down the aisle or anything. There are some churches, uh, perhaps you've experienced that, but not so. But some people may call us holy rollers. But I, um, I just got off my notes here, got thinking about people rolling down the aisle. <laughs> they may call us that, but they should not be able to deny the kindness, the love, the generosity, and sympathy of heart that should emanate from spirit-led people uh, in a biblical church. So they're, first of all, full of goodness. And then he goes on to say, filled with all knowledge. Knowledge. This has fallen on hard times today. In an age that emphasizes entertainment and happiness and felt needs and so on, the idea of emphasizing doctrine has been been frowned upon you know I, I've heard multiple times oh we don't want to focus on these things we need to focus on Jesus well which Jesus are you talking about oh you know the Jesus who uh, was in heaven came down to earth became a man lived the perfect life died on the cross was, was buried and rose again. Oh, you just went through a whole bunch of theology there to define the Jesus. That's the true Jesus. So to under, to, we're, we're, not, we're not to ignore the idea of doctrine and theology. Second John chapter nine, uh, verse nine, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. This is the teaching of Christ, the understanding of who he is. And to do so, we must have an understanding of theology. We need to be able to discern truth from error. As we saw in Sunday school, I got the tail end of that uh, this morning. If we can get this down, false teachers will not have free reign in a church that is well taught. And we have to be careful because there's so much false teaching out there that we need to be learning the truth. And therefore, when the truth becomes part of us, we're able to discern truth from error. Now, you'll be listening to somebody preaching and you'll hear something. Whoa, wait a minute. That's not right. And because what it does, it does damage to this certain area of theology, the person of Christ or the atonement or even the creation or whatever. You've got the... You, 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 you've, You've learned and you've studied and you understand these things so that you are protected from false teaching. Now, we are not talking here about having mere facts or theology. There are people that are full of biblical facts and they're full of theological knowledge, but they don't know the Lord. You know, I've met many of them. You know, they can spout off Bible verses, but their, their lives are in complete opposition uh, to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they, uh, their mouth utters curses, but they're full of theological knowledge. And we're not talking about that type of knowledge. A church, however, should possess a good working knowledge of the scriptures that is it, guided by the Spirit of God. We need to have a broad sense of the truth from Genesis to Revelation, what the scriptures contain. You know, and, and one thing I appreciated in, in the Sunday school class uh, this was a while back, we did that Dust to Glory series from Genesis to Revelation, learning what the, the, the themes of Scripture the whole way through the Bible. And also a church should be well-versed in Christian theology. Uh, theology proper is simply the study of God. You know, at one time, if you wanted to be educated, you had to study theology. Theology was considered the foundation of all education. It was known as the queen of the sciences. You had to have a, a good study of theology before you went on to, to other sciences or, or other types of learning. And I've said before that a church well taught in theology is better prepared to deal with the dangerous heresies which afflict the church at large. You know, that, that I, I'm very grateful that there is a hunger here 
for the, for the folks when it comes to the area of, of the Bible and good teaching and theology. And I believe that in many ways that, that we, are, we are somewhat inoculated to the heresies which are floating all around. And, and the more I think of it, the more distraught, I guess you'd say, I get. I get a catalog from a Christian book distributor and I open up that catalog and there's heretic after heretic after heretic after heretic. And every once in a while, oh, there's, there's a good teacher. Heretic, heretic. It's full. Of, we need to be well taught in the Bible and in how to put all of these teachings together, which is theology. So then, the facts of the Bible, the knowledge is to be tempered with love. What happens to knowledge alone? Knowledge alone puffs up with pride. It does no good to have a head full of knowledge and a heart full of pride. We must be led and, in, and filled with the Spirit of God. And so then we have goodness, and then we have the knowledge. What else do we find in an ideal church? Verse 14 once again, the last part. Able also to admonish one another. Able to admonish one another. That admonish means to warn or to counsel or to exhort, to be competent to instruct one another. Now we don't have, and I've been in some churches like this, where you have one person that's capable of teaching and that's it. Everybody else just sits there and listens. I think at a, at a, a good biblical church, even if you're not a teacher, you ought to be capable of that. You ought to, to have the, the knowledge, you ought to be, be learned enough to be able to sit down and describe certain things to, to people uh, about the, the Christian faith. Just simply because you've listened and learned and you've been, been faithful. So we ought to be able to help one another. Now, how many times do, and I've seen this, the, what, who, the people who seem to be the meekest people in the church, they would not come behind this pulpit if you put, if you said either you, you come behind here or I'm going to throw you in a den of lions. Give me the lions. I don't want to come behind here. And speak. That's the, 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 the quietest, meekest people. But I've seen them talking to others, whether it be their, their children or it be to a neighbor or somebody, someone, in the, and they're able to explain the great doctrines of God in such a way that, that they can understand it. Now, that, that you have, that with that knowledge, you're able to admonish one another. We ought to be able to help one another within the church as well. Galatians 6.1 Brethren, if a man be overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. You know, if, if you're not paying attention to the teaching to the Sunday school to the learning you're not reading the Bible yourself you won't be able to do this but we ought to be able to admonish one another I think I'm once again way off of my notes where am I here okay so then the combination of goodness and knowledge provides a fertile ground for a church to be a real help for fellow believers uh, those struggling against sin and spiritual weaknesses and false doctrines, each one is able to help each other in these areas. If one of the members finds themselves under the influence of a popular false teacher, those who are spiritual, as we, we read there, should be prepared to offer warning with real substance. Not just say, that guy's bad. Well, I don't have no idea. No. No, he's, he's wrong because he teaches... A, against the, the biblical doctrine of the Holy Spirit or against the Trinity or whatever to be knowledgeable, to be able to help each other. A biblical church is one led by the Spirit of God, knowledgeable in the truth and capable of edifying one another in the grace of God. So then, these were the kind of Christians that Paul was addressing at Rome. This is the, the, the people that made up the, the church at Rome. Which explains why we have such an in-depth epistle. He was able to take them down deep because they were prepared and eager to learn. So then we see this, the ideal church. Now what about the responsibility of ministers? 
we find here in verse 15 as we move along. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. So here we have Paul as a minister and his work with the church. We can see certain things about that that I think we can learn as far as from my responsibilities as a minister or whoever comes behind the pulpit, how we ought to be. Uh, first of all, we see the idea of boldness. Now, there's almost an apologetic tone to the writing of Paul. I've come to you with great boldness. Now, Paul had just praised them for their good qualities, yet he was bold in pointing out some areas where they needed work. Now remember Paul's position. Paul didn't found the Church of Rome. The Church of Rome was probably made up of some very prominent people. There were probably some within the Church of Rome which may have had associations with the palace of the king, the emperor of Rome. There's a good, good possibility that was the case. So these are the kind of people that Paul is dealing with. He was almost coming as an outsider. The work of God requires boldness. Now one thing to look for in the minister of the word is what is called the prophetic voice. It doesn't mean that the minister is going to be pre- trying to, to predict the future. But what it means is that the minister takes the word of God and proclaims it as the word of God. It goes beyond merely the academic. You know, we're going to learn some basic facts. No, we're going to learn this and we're going to apply it. And you're going to do it because it's the word of God. You're required to do it. God's going to hold you responsible. This is the prophetic voice. This is the boldness that is required in the minister. The minister needs to realize that they are speaking beyond their own authority. You know, I am probably a very, and, and, well, maybe some, some of you know me, and uh, I tend to be a timid person. You know, I, I, this isn't really a natural thing for me, you know, to, to get up and tell people what to do. The only time I ever do that, and, and whether it be on the job or whether it be in the church, is if I know I've been given the proper authority to do so. Now, if I'm, if I'm on a job somewhere and I see somebody goofing off, that's not my problem. You know, I, I mean, it's, I'll let them, do, and if it's affecting my work, I might have to talk to somebody about it. But it, it, I don't have the authority to, to, to tell them what to do. I'm not the boss. But if I'm given that position, I will do it. Now, that, that's just, just my nature. But because I've been given the authority to open the word of God, I must proclaim it as it is. I'm responsible for that. I know that when I stand before God, God is going to say, did you do this faithfully? Why did you hold back on this? Well, I was afraid. I was afraid I'd upset some folks. You know, there was people there that I know were doing certain things, and if I said that, you know, I might, it might really cause some trouble in the church. Is that what I called you to do? You're to be the voice. You're to be the voice of the Word of God. So when I come to certain things, and, and I don't make it a habit to get into people's lives and say, okay, well, who's, uh, what, what are you into? What are you into? Let me write these down. I'll have my next sermon. <laughs> that's, that's, that's totally ridiculous. But I preach through the word. And if this, the word is affecting you, I'm responsible to proclaim it faithfully and boldly. That's the responsibility of the minister. I, I've heard people say sometimes, what right do you have to say that? Well, it's not a right, it's a responsibility. You know, I was talking to one fellow one time. He doesn't go to church. So when I go to church, they are always calling me to repent. Oh. I told him, I said, hey, that's what the church is called to do. That's what the Bible tells you, and you need to repent. You know, so uh, some people don't like being told, but they need to be told, and we're responsible to tell them, and we are to do so boldly. And so, and also, something that's in here that I think might, might be good to point out. He says, Brethren, I have written to you more, bold, more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. We have reminding. Now, I am sure that many of, many of us have been in the church 40, 50, 60 years, maybe longer. And you've heard some of these things over and over and over again. How many times have we heard about the cleansing blood of Christ? We need to hear it over and over again. We should not be like the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17, 
always looking to have their intellect tantalized with something new. Give me something. That's, that's where people get off in all kinds of crazy doctrines. We have the, the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in. The wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. We need to be reminded of these things. It's not like, okay, I've learned this doctrine, close it, never have to touch it again. No, it's going to come up as the scriptures are opened many, many times because we need to be reminded because we forget. I've heard many times that repetition is the key to learning. The more we hear it, the more we understand it. But, uh, this boldness in the teaching of Paul came as a result of God's grace. God knows exactly what the church needs, and in his grace he provides men willing to speak the truth, whether they be Sunday school teachers or ministers or whatever. His judgment, however, is evident in hiding the truth through unfaithful ministers, through those teaching false doctrine. God, in permitting this, is judging those people. And those people love to have it that way. Jeremiah 5.31, the prophets prophesy, prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? You know, you think, I hear these preachers preaching error, and sometimes damnable heresies, where if the people believe those things, they're going to go to hell. And yet the people out there are just eating it up. And if somebody came behind the pulpit preaching the truth, as I said, they'd be out of the church. That's the judgment of God upon them. People pleasers are sent to a people under judgment. So then moving on, and we'll quickly tie up here. The minister as priest in verse 16. That I may be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering the gospel of God. That the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So we see here the minister's priest. We are not saying that the minister is a priest. Now, this is being spoken of in a metaphorical sense. The priests of the Old Testament have passed off the scene with the coming of Christ. Their duties are now fulfilled. The law has been fulfilled, the ceremonial law. There is no need of a priest. We believe strongly in the Protestant doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. You don't need a mediator to go to God. We have a mediator, Jesus. A priest would go to God for the people. You don't need that any longer. I am not going to God for you, except whenever I pray for you. I'm not going to God and saying, God, forgive them, God, uh, and, and offering sacrifice. No, none of that. So when I'm talking about the ministers as priests, we're talking about something different. Paul was a, is as a priest to the Gentiles. Now the word minister here is different. This teaches us, I believe, what he's, what he's trying to show us. Now it's not the word for deacon. And a lot of times we have that, or servant. But this is the word that refers to one dedicated to an official service of the people, like one holding an office uh, in the government or within uh, the, the Old Testament church or something like that. And, and Paul holds this office as a minister of Christ for the Gentiles. However, he's not offering sacrifices for them. He is offering them up as a sacrifice to God. Remember Romans 12, 1? It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So Paul is saying here, I'm going to tie this up uh, quickly here. He is saying, I have gone to the Gentiles. I presented the gospel to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see through signs and wonders. Paul, as a, an apostle, had the, 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 the power of, of miracles. And he did so. And these people came believing. And Paul then takes these Gentiles and says, Lord, here they are to you. And he offers them up holy and acceptable. How are they holy and acceptable? These were pagans and immoral people. He takes them and cleanses them with the blood of Jesus Christ. The, the Holy Spirit applies this work of Christ. God the Father has chosen them and called them. God the Son redeems them. And the Holy Spirit cleanses them 
uh, through sanctification. He, he, he does that great work within them. And they are now acceptable to God and offered up uh, to God as an offering. And Paul says here they are acceptable to God. May the Lord be glorified in the work he does in the lives of his people, the church. Let us pray.